Thank you for tuning in to the Be Blessed broadcast. Let's go into the service already in progress. Amen, Apostle, as you pretty much painted the picture as to our history as from where we began to how we've gotten to this point in time. As we were looking at the text in Joshua, I do want to point out that God is very strategic in how he promotes and how he renders from one place to the next. That. that he does nothing happenstance. He does nothing, Deacon Watson, by chance. That God begins to set something before us, give us the opportunity to respond. And if we respond the way that he desires us to respond, he allows us to forge ahead. And he allows us to forge ahead and reminds us that I'm giving giving you this because you've already proven yourself. I'm going to say that again. Wow. He strategically sets us up. He begins to test us and then we follow the test and obey what wow. he's telling us to do. He says you can forge ahead and as you're forging ahead, Minister Des, you don't have to pay for this. You don't have to fight for this. You don't have to wrestle for this. You've already did that when you accepted the challenge and you did what I told you to do. Now you just go in and take what I'm telling you to forge ahead in. When we look at the book of Joshua, it is about a book of, vec of, of wars, about a book of victories, yes. fighting and seeing the hand of God. We know here when we begin to see Joshua on the scene, Moses, the servant of the Lord, is now dead. Yeah. He has already proven himself. He has already took his test. He has already led them over the Red Sea. He's already had his fights with Pharaoh, wow. the man who he grew up under. Part of his test was being able to stand Tina before his mentor and tell his mentor, let my God's people go. Wow. I don't care to receive or to be the beneficiary of your kingdom. I serve a greater God that's greater than you. He's only known the hand of Pharaoh, but part of his test, Sister Tracy, was to stand in front of his mentor and tell his mentor, I serve a greater God than you. He passed that test. He stayed in Egypt. He led God's people out. He stayed there for the plagues and he led God's people out. He led them across the Red Sea. Help me in this place. Holy Spirit. He withstood his test. He began to lead them across the Red Sea and he brought them out to the wilderness. He was all alone taking a test that God was allowing him to take. So when the opportunity came to release them from Egypt, hallelujah, into the place of promise, he had already passed that test. He had led them through the Red Sea. He got them out into the wilderness. Moses minding his business, Deacon and Yolanda, going up to the mountaintop to get the commandments from God. But little did he know he had taken a people from a system that they had become so embedded in. He had taken Taking a people who had been delivered from a physical place, but they were still mentally stuck, Jasmine. Oh. They were not in Egypt, but they were still thinking like Egyptians. He was not mindful of that because he was able to split from Egypt when God raised him up. Hey. He was able to do what God told him to do when God raised him up. So I can imagine him thinking this ought to be clear. Y'all cried and said God delivered us. Y'all cried and said by reason of these taskmasters, we're out here making brick and mortar. God deliver us. Our fingers are tired. Our fingers are nimble. And then when God raised you up a deliverer, you want to go and start fighting against God. In Moses' mind, he can't reconcile this. He's just thinking, Deacon and Shalanda, he has a compliant people who Asked to be delivered and now they're delivered what's the problem now he's not thinking Teresa that once they delivered they're gonna go and make a calf he's not thinking that once they're delivered they're gonna turn their back on the God that delivered them he's not thinking that once he pulled them out of Egypt that they were gonna turn on him and turn on God he was not thinking that because he was the one who had to stand before his mentor face to face they weren't standing before Pharaoh they were not telling telling Pharaoh to let my people go. They weren't the ones with a speech impediment and had to go and talk before Pharaoh. All that was on Moses' shoulder. Somebody told me that the one that wears the, the crown is heavy on the head that leads, help me in this place, Holy Ghost. And so as Moses is leading them, he was once Pharaoh's son. Now he's Pharaoh's enemy. That's a test for somebody. Many of us can't 
can't endure that kind of test. I was once your son, now I've become your enemy. And the word of God declares in Galatians, have I become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. Moses had to look to Pharaoh and tell him the truth. You are a creation of the greatest creator. You are not a God, Pharaoh. I know somebody who you will bow down to. He's not only the God in the heavens, but he ruleth in the kingdom of men. And you will let God's people go. You will let God's people go. You can get your magicians. You can get your philosophers. You can get your tacticians. And they can tell you whatever they want to tell you. But at the end of the day, you will let God's people go. He had to stand before his mentor, toe-to-toe, face-to-face, in order to pass the test with God. I got to ask you on the day, what type of test are you failing on the day? The people that you thought you needed in your corner, the people that you thought that signed off on your overtime, the people that you thought signed your loan documents, the people that you thought will sign you to get into a college, the people that you thought will sign your new business venture. I submit to you, greater is he that's on the inside of you than anything that's worn on the outside of you. He had to pass a test, Elder Shatina. And God is ever mindful, Deacon and Shalanda, when we're faithful to the test. The book of Acts chapter 10, Pastor Chris, it opens up and said there was a man that feared the Lord. It was a centurion named Cornelius from Caesarea who was over a centurion of people. I'll say that again for those of you who know the art of alliteration. He was a centurion. His name was Cornelius. He was from Caesarea and he feared the Lord. I'll say that one more time. His name was Cornelius. He was a centurion and he was from Caesarea. And the Bible said he feared the Lord and he gave many alms unto the Lord. Even though he was an Italian from the Italian band of Roman descent, he feared the Lord. The word of God says in verse number four, I love this because it goes to show that God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love that you have demonstrated toward the saints and that you still minister to them. You can't do nothing for God and thank you, go outdo him. You can't do nothing for God and thank you, go out do it. I know you thought that those was a hundred fat bands. Help me, Holy Ghost. But you already saw God outdid you in one year when it came to your medication. I thank God done paid you back three, four, five times. And not only paid you back with medication, but he gave you your life back too. Something you couldn't pay for. You not being mindful of that when you putting it on the table. But God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. You passed that test. And some years later, that $100,000 C, not that you came by a miracle, but it came up as a memorial before God. It was a sweet smell before God. And God said, you gave $100,000, but you're going to need about a half a million to take this medication to keep you alive. And I'm not just going to keep you uh, with the medication. I'm going to keep you alive and restore your health because you can't beat God given no matter. I come to tell somebody who's been faithful in your service, who've been faithful in your giving, who've been faithful in your prayers, who've been faithful in your servitude, who served God when nobody else could be found, who served God when everybody else was missing on the job, who served God when everybody in your house is asleep, who served God when you couldn't get no help in the house of God. God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. You can't do something for God and God don't bring it back up for a memorial. This is our situation with our friend Cornelius here in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius just loved the Lord. He was from Caesarea and he was a centurion, which means he was over a hundred people. He knew how to lead people, but he knew how to follow. He understood, although I'm from Rome, hallelujah, I know somebody that's greater than me. And so I'm going to not only pray to God, but I'm going to give alms. And the Bible said in a vision, the Lord went to Cornelius and told him, he said he looked up when he saw in the vision, he was afraid. He said, what is it, Lord? This is what Cornelius is saying. Why are you troubling me? Why are you giving me this vision? Go to verse number four. Help me, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 
He says, what is it, Lord? And he said unto them, he said, who is the him? The Lord said unto Cornelius, your prayers and your alms are come up for a memorial before God. If you've done anything, Elder Stacy, for God in the house of God, I come to remind you on this 25th anniversary that your prayer and your alms are up before a memorial before God. Elder Denise, all of the years of praying, all of the years of serving, somebody need to step in the water and understand that your prayers, your alms, your giving, your good deed, your servitude has gone into the nostril of God and God is ready to bless you for your labor of love. Look at your neighbor and tell him you can't outdo God giving. You can't outdo God giving no matter how hard you try. He said, Cornelius, I wanted you to understand your prayer and your giving has come up before me. And God not only saved Cornelius, but he saved his entire household. Cornelius couldn't pay for that blessing. He couldn't get enough to get that kind of blessing. And some of us began to think, well, I'm giving and giving and giving. I come to tell you, you can't outdo God giving no matter how hard you try. If you thought you give and 10, God will turn around and give you a hundred. If you give God a hundred, he'll give you half a million. Help me in this place, Holy Ghost. You will never outdo God giving. You may have come to the church and you've given your time and God will redeem your time. You got long life. You got longevity. All your friends around you are dying. People in your family are dying. But you alive and you still kicking because God remember the years where you served in the house of God when you didn't get a paycheck when you gave your service when nobody patted you on the back while everybody is sleeping in their grave God remembered you and still allowed you to keep on living and allow their heart to keep on ticking you can't outdo God giving sister Jenkins no matter how hard you try you served here in the house of God you've answered the church folks you vacuum and you clean but look at you today sister Jenkins look at you today JJ look at you today elder Denise look at you today mother money you you can't do something for God and you think you're going to outdo God in your giving. Your prayers, Kiana. Your giving. May the works I've done speak for me, oh God. God is saying to you, when you have served me, when you've given your arms, it has come up for a memorial. I'm telling you to forge your hand. If you're not forging a hand, you have simply denied your blessing, not because I didn't give it to you, but because you didn't believe me for it. I'm telling you, in this season, as God is telling you to forge your head, it's not because you may have the route, the route of resources, you have the right connections, you have the right aptitude, you have the ingenuity to create. I'm, I submit to you, most of the time we don't have any of that. It's but by the grace of God that many of us are entering into deals, entering into rooms, sitting at tables, getting blessings that our eyes have not seen, our ears have not heard. It hasn't even entered into your heart the things that God has prepared for you that love him God said I gave you a test just like I test Moses it is that same test he gave Cornelius just as he blessed Moses he allowed, Moses only forfeited the promised land because he kept his eyes on people as Moses kept his eyes on God he could have led them not only across the Red Sea, but he could have led them across the Jordan River. But because he got his eyes on people camp, he missed his opportunity to make it good with God. And God says, we've come to the end of the road, buddy. I can't go no further with you because you're more concerned about pacifying the people than you are with pacifying me. I thank you for your service. I blessed you with Pharaoh. I've crossed you over the Red Sea. I've kept you in the wilderness for 40 years, but now your season is up. That is a word for somebody who got your mind on people. God will use you as long as you want to be used. As long as you avail yourself to be used, you have to be fit for the master's use. Keep your eyes unto the hills from which come at your help. Don't allow yourself to be distracted with people because people just like Moses will make you miss your promised land. It's not that God didn't intend for him to go there. He started looking at the people and talking on the people's level. Instead of staying the leader, he got on the level with the people. 
That is a word for somebody on the day. You may not understand the rebellious people. That, this is a word for you, Pastor, that God is calling you to lead. You may not understand their temperament or their disposition, but you are not their God. You are simply an overseer, an under-shepherd to lead God's people. He gives the directives and you follow them. And when we get to Joshua, we find another military tactician. This young man, just as Moses had tried and proven himself, just as Cornelius had tried and proven himself, if you begin to think and, 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 and get your mind meditating on the scriptures, God never promotes until you've served first. Whoa. Thank you, JJ. I like that. I like Thank you, mother. Most of us want to be promoted, then we, we promote and then still don't want to serve. That's the time we living in today. You get promoted and still don't want to serve. But God never promotes before service because the service serves as a test to see where your loyalties lie. To see who you going to listen to. To see if you going to be easily bought. To see if you can be manipulated by favors. To see if you can be bribed. To see if you can be manipulated. To see if you will abandon God's vision for your own vision. God is testing. He's trying that's why he said I led thee in the wilderness in Deuteronomy all these years to try you to test you to see what was in your heart to see whether you will obey me or not God is always testing us Elijah to see have we learned anything from the Egypt he delivered us from to see if we've learned anything from the Egypt he's delivered us from to see if we've learned anything from the Egypt he's delivered us from to see if we've learned anything from the Egypt he's delivered us from and some of us just like the children of Israel we left Egypt but Egypt has not left us we still think the same we still choose the same we still process the same we have the same company we have the same friends. We talk that same old talk. We got them same old schemes. We got that same old cool hand Luke. We got that same old jive talk. We got that same old jive walk. Ain't nothing changed. God just moved you from the place, but you're still an Egyptian. And God said, ain't nothing I can do with you. He will allow us to be tested. We first see Joshua in Exodus chapter 17. He's on the scene and the word of God begins in that chapter said the children of Israel began complaining. They're complaining in Exodus as I've told you in times before. Exodus means to exit, to leave out. So the book of Exodus Alondas is about them leaving out of, of Egypt and going into a place of the wilderness toward Canaan. So they are complaining. You asked to be delivered. I delivered you. You asked to be from under Pharaoh. I took you from under Pharaoh. Got to ask you on a day because we have a tendency to wag our hands at the people in the Bible. And we begin to say some of the things that they do are so asinine. And we can't understand how they so discombobulated. How they don't understand what good, how good God is being. But the reality is we're just a modern day Israelite in 2024. God has shown us. He has given us his word. He has proven himself. He's given us wonder, signs, and miracle after miracle and yet we still don't believe God. They're leaving out of Egypt, Minister Des. Now they have been brought out with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm. They, I can imagine, were still even complaining as they're crossing over the Red Sea on dry land. The fact that I can look down and the mushiness is not in the waters and I'm able to walk across on dry land as though the Red Sea is a desert and you were able to do that for me. I already know there's a God and can't nobody tell me otherwise but while they're walking they're complaining I can imagine saying well we're going as fast as we can Moses well you know what you should have dealt with Pharaoh you know you often get an opinion you can oh help me Holy Ghost the ignorant are so expressive they got a lot to say about a lot of things that they know nothing about the ignorant are so expressive because if you knew how to get out from under there, you wouldn't have been crying to ask God to raise you up a deliverer. And some of us, you mad at your Moses and your Joshua on this side. But if you had the answer to financial stability, if you had the answer to fellowship, if you had the answer to building your faith, if you had the answer to building your family, you would have done it by now and you would have passed us up a long time ago. 
They begin complaining in Exodus chapter 17 because they had not been used to having an opinion. <laughs> you got to be careful about giving people an opinion who've not had one. You try to give them a little room and they just take it way too far. They begin to express how discontented they were about being in the wilderness. We want water. Give us water. God allow water to come from a rock. And the Bible declared that the Amalekites began to come upon the Israelites. I believe that the Lord allowed the Amalekites to come upon them because they was complaining. He allowed their enemies to come upon them. So the Lord, the word of the Lord said in Joshua, the first time we hear of Joshua in Exodus 17, the word of the Lord said, and Moses told Joshua to go and find ye some men so that you can go and fight. Some of us missed that on the day. He didn't say so we can go and fight. Go and find some men so I can go and fight with them. He is leading Joshua as a spiritual father and letting him know I've already paid my dues. I've already passed my test. I've already served the Lord. I've already turned my back on some bribes. Now it's your time, Joshua, if you ever choose to lead God's people. The word of the Lord said, and Joshua went and found some men and they began to fight the Amalekites and the word of the Lord said and Aaron and her I love this I don't remember what verse it is Aaron and her began to go and get a rock <laughs> go to the next verse and it came to pass when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed so as long as his hands were up they were winning and when he let them down Amalek, the enemy, prevailed. Verse number 12. But Moses' hands were what? I come to let you know that after leading a bunch of complaining people, a bunch of discontented people, a bunch of grumbling people, Denise, it may not be physically tired, but it can emotionally wear a leader out. That is a word for somebody who's a hellion in the house of God, who's always complaining, giving the leader a hard time. Could you be a weight on your leader? Moses' hands were heavy. Look what they did. They did what? They took a stone and they set it under him. Who is the him? Moses. Look at the contradiction in scripture. They set them, took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and her stayed up. Y'all missed it. <laughs> ah, help me, Holy Ghost. Because this is a word for some of us who think that you've been serving as hard as your leaders have. And you think that you deserve the same kind of break, the same kind of honor, the same kind of recognition as your leaders. We see here in the scriptures, they went and got a stone for him to sit down while they stood up. There are going to be some times, Joshua, that you're going to be on the battlefield. Joshua wasn't even there with Moses. He was down there fighting the Amalekites while Moses was sitting down. Help us in this place, Holy Ghost, because the enemy, Pastor Tay, will make us think we're doing something. The enemy will make us think that our leaders are getting it too easy. The enemy will make us think that they don't deserve that kind of treatment. The enemies will make us think, y'all doing too much for them. But my Bible said that Joshua was fighting the Amalekites while Moses was sitting down at the top of the mountain. <laughs> Joshua... It's fighting in the valley, T. And Moses is sitting in the mountain on a rock. And while he's sitting there, Aaron and her are standing. They didn't all sit down. Just Moses sat down. Because Moses had paid his dues. Moses had faced his mentor. Moses had turned his back on Egypt. Moses had already endured the plagues. Moses already crossed them over the Red Sea. Moses already got them out into it. He paid his dues already. When are you going to start paying your dues so you can forge ahead? He's fighting in the valley. Moses at the top of the mountain, sitting down. And Aaron and her are holding his arms. We see Joshua here for the first time in scripture. 
We see him again in Exodus 24. The Bible declare when Moses is getting ready yeah. to make his ascent up to Mount Sinai, Jasmine, yeah. to get the commandments for the Lord. The people couldn't even approach God. They had to stay back at a distance. So at the beginning of Exodus 24, the people are assigned to stay back. Then there are leaders who go with Moses, 70 elders, Aaron and his sons. They're at the base of the mountain. You see the progression here. The people stay back in the camp. The 70 leaders, Aaron and his son, the Levitical priest, they went with Moses as well as Joshua, and they stayed at the bottom of the hill. Then they left them there. Then Moses and Joshua went up mid-mountain. Then Moses went to God all by himself. I wish you hear the progression in the story of God. The people stayed back in the camp. Then the leaders, the 70 elders, the Levitical priest, Aaron and his sons, they went with Moses and Joshua, and they stood at the base of the mountain. But then after that, Joshua and Moses went up mid-mountain and then after that Moses leaves Joshua there and then Moses go and see God all by himself you got to be a strong leader because when God calls you he ain't calling you to call somebody beside you it's not based upon you and Joshua I'm going to use you to train Joshua if your leaders give you the opportunity to walk up the mountain with them, don't look at it and count it in honor in the name of Jesus because the people stayed in the camp. The leaders in the Levitical peace were at the base of the mountain. It was only Joshua that went with Moses mid-mountain. The others were in the camp at the base of the mountain, but it was Joshua. God had found favor with Joshua. Could it have been when he had fought the battle in Exodus 17 that he had seen his labor of love? He had seen his commitment. He had seen his loyalties. He had paid his dues. It was that same Joshua who would look in Numbers chapter 14 and say, we're more than able to overcome it. Don't allow the report of the, the ten to, to, to discontent us and make us think that we can't. It was that same Joshua. Now Joshua had paid his dues and now we see him forging ahead in Joshua chapter 1. He's forging ahead. We've seen him in Exodus 17 fighting the Amalekites. We've seen him in Exodus 24 going up mid-mountain to, to the mountain of God with Moses. He's under the tutelage. He's under training, Teresa. And when the man and the woman of God gives opportunities to be trained, many of you don't even recognize what it is. Oh, Rabba Koshedelebe. You take it lightly, but it was the same training that he got from Moses that qualified him to forge ahead and to lead God's people into the place of promise. It's the same training we see with Joshua. Joshua is a type of Christ. We see Joshua, we see Jesus. His name is Jesus in the Greek, but in Hebrew is translated Joshua. He's a type of Christ. We see the similarities between the two. The, the, central, the central story of redemption was Christ's work on the cross. That he will provide our people. He will provide us with rest. After we've come and accepted him, read Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. He talks about a rest because many people will assume that Canaan represents heaven. Right. Canaan represents a type of rest. The same kind of rest we're supposed to be getting when we come to Jesus Christ and give him our hand in our heart. And the central theme for redemption in the Old Testament is Joshua and Moses taking them out of Egypt into the place of promise. When we get here in Joshua chapter 1, the Lord is telling Joshua, don't you be afraid. I've been preparing you for a long time. I want to leave some of you with this. Don't get your eyes on your Moses. Don't get your eyes on your leaders. We have our own tests. You have your own tests that you have to follow. You will not be able to forge ahead if you don't pass your test. And God is allowing you to take the same test over and over again because you keep failing it. God is saying to us as a corporate body, you've been at this place long enough. I come to do signs, wonders, and miracles. The word of the Lord says, you and your sons shall be for signs and wonders. 
God wants to allow this ministry to be for a sign and a wonder. He wants to do with us expeditiously what no other ministry is doing. Nobody's talking about paying off their mortgage in five years. It, it, it's, it's not even the seventh year. Five years, Deacon, in a recession. I don't care if they didn't tell you, we are in a type of recession right now. Anytime you can go to the grocery store, get a bread, some bologna, some cheese, and a, 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 a Pepsi, and some chips, and, and, a, and a pack of a ground beef that's 80% lean and 20% fat, and they tell you your bill is $80, we're in a recession. These are the two $80 bags. Two bags. And depending on how much meat you get, it may be one. But God will allow you to be a sign and a wonder. A sign and a wonder when he puts his super on your natural. When God tells you to forge your hand, Sister Jenkins, he said, I'm telling you to go and occupy. You don't have to fight the enemy. You don't have to wrestle with him. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your battle is not with people. It's not with entities. Because if God be for you, no devil in hell can be against you. When God raises you up, can't nobody pull you down. When God approves the law, I don't care how many things they try to find wrong with it. They, at the end of the day, got to extend that money in your direction <clears throat> I don't care what your FICO score is when God is ready to bless you he gonna bless you you just have to have the mentality to forge your head and not look to the right not look to the left but say God I've already paid my dues just as you remember Cornelius just as you remember Moses just as you remember Joshua you're no respecter of persons and if you did it back then you're the same God that's doing it today Jesus Christ the same yesterday today and forevermore I do not change I still will not be outdone in my giving you can't do something for the Lord and don't thank mother money you gonna outdo him doing it ask Cornelius ask Abraham ask David ask Moses ask, jo ask anybody in the ask Yolanda ask the Campbells you really think you doing something God forbid if, if she had to leverage that money for her help today, we may not even see her today because she wouldn't have had enough to pay for her medication. But God said, you can't sow a seed and I don't increase it exponentially. You can't give me something, Elder Stacy, and I don't breathe on it and multiply it. I'm the God of multiplication. If you give me five, I'm going to give you 10. I'm going to give you 25. You give me six, I ain't giving you 12, I'm going to give you 36. You give me seven, I'm not giving you 14, I'm going to give you 49. Because God doesn't add, and in most cases, he won't even multiply. He exponentially increases you. Thank you for tuning in to the Be Blessed broadcast. We pray that you are blessed by the message. If you were, please like, share, comment, and definitely subscribe. But remember, here at Showers of Blessings, we want you to be blessed.